It's a pleasure to have uh, Wei Barzi from uh, Materials and Interfaces Department in the Chemistry. Uh, Wei did his undergrad studies in, in uh, Hebrew University in Physics and Math, and uh, after which he moved to Weizmann, and uh, did his master's here with Sam Safran, and then <coughs> moved to the Physics faculty, actually, to the Department of Complex Systems, and he did his uh, PhD here with Alicia Moses working on the membranes. And uh, following that, he did his postdoc in Rockefeller University with Sam uh, Lipschaber. And that's where he started, uh, I think, his, his vision actually to give up uh, on the membranes that he worked on so much and try to build uh, or imitate biology without the membranes. <coughs> and so it's, it's, again, it's a, a physicist uh, view on biology. And uh, <coughs> he came back uh, to Weizmann in uh, 2003 and uh, continued to work on, on this vision. And, uh, and today we'll hear about uh, how this is coming along. So thank you, Oi. So I'll tell you about our work in the past 10 years or so. Uh, as Ofer said, trying to reconstruct uh, biology in, uh, in a different way. And, oops, yeah, this is the first important, most important slide. These are the people currently in the lab. Uh, Shirley Daube is a staff scientist who has been developing all the program on machine assembly, together with uh, Ohad Vonchak, who's here as well, and develops a chip for uh, expressing genes that uh, combine together to make assemblies, machines. Uh, Alexandra Tayar and Eyal Karlsbrunn, have been uh, developing the DNA compartments, which I'll show first. Uh, AL, they're all here. AL, all, both of them uh, started here. And uh, Dan Bracha worked on the uh, physics of uh, the DNA compartment. And Michael Levy recently joined the lab and also works on the properties of the uh, compartment. These are the recent uh, publications. And a few slides of introduction. I'll try to be as simple as I can without invoking any jargon, but please stop me if it's unclear. So compartments in evolution and design, prevalent nature designs compartment over evolution. Uh, we be, we're going to be talking about making proteins outside the living cell and on a surface of a solid. So I'd like you to understand what we're talking about, what are the concepts. So typically membrane, membranes are the boundaries for all compartments. This is the nucleus of our cells. And outside the nucleus is another compartment where all the ribosomes reside. You see these black little dots are all ribosomes. They're organized. They're highly concentrated. Nature uses these kind of segregated compartments to optimize the reaction, in this case, of making first the RNA and then the protein outside. So the reasons why compartments are, are made, both in, uh, in evolution and man-made, the e-chip, allows us to do computation by performing different functions and propagating from one compartment to another in reduced dimensionality often. And recent, in the past 10 years, the emergence of microfluidic chips, which allow us to basically handle small volumes of liquids in a controlled way, open and close mechanical valves on small chips and carry out complicated set of reactions inside these kind of uh, fabricated uh, chambers. Today, I'll be talking about a different kind of chip one in which active processes, protein making, occurs in a man-made environment on a chip. Uh, to make sure everybody's on the same page, again, it's never uh, too simple to show the, the central dogma of molecular biology. Can you speak up? Sure, sure. DNA makes RNA, makes protein, starting from the DNA, which <coughs> codes for the protein, the basis of the DNA, the four, the alphabet of the DNA. Uh, codes for the protein, the genetic code is the translation of the DNA into the functional uh, molecules, the proteins going from um, nucleic acids to amino acids. This is done by appropriate enzymes. The DNA codes for the, the sequence of the DNA codes for the sequence of the amino acids. There's a start region on a piece of DNA, which is called a promoter. This is where the first enzyme binds. It's called RNA polymerase. This is this guy here, and it binds here in a directional manner. <coughs> 
polymerizes a copy of the DNA into RNA, it's called transcription, mRNA, and this in turn serves as a template, this polymer, a copy of the DNA serves as a template for the ribosome, this is this uh, bulk, bulky guy here, which reads through the mRNA, produces a chain of amino acids which folds into the protein. And this is in a nutshell something that of course happens in every cell universally, but we're going to do this in a test tube as well. In fact, the genetic code was deciphered by cell-free protein synthesis, namely proteins which were made from, from synthesized message RNA in a test tube. So the ability to make proteins by using cell extracts, which are supplemented by all the nutrients, <coughs> all the amino acids, all the nucleotides, all the building blocks and energy resources, this has all been around for many, many years. And we're going to do this on a chip. And I'll try to explain to you why we do that. <coughs> so, a couple of more slides of introduction. These are some of my favorite examples of what biology can do to each his own. Uh, on many scales, gene expression occurs in compartments. Uh, on a large scale, this is a multicellular organism, the developing embryo. And what you see here is patterns in space. These stripes are gene exp genes which are expressed specifically at designated location. There's an underlying program, a circuit. There's communication between cells. There's transport. Decisions are made. This is all autonomous and highly, highly precise. These, this is the magic of, of development on a, on a much larger scale than what happens inside, inside the bacterium. This is a phage. It's a virus. It's called T4. It's a scale of about 100 nanometer. And this is a virus which infects bacteria. And look at it, it's a lunar lander at the scale of 100 nanometer. It's composed of a few dozen different proteins. All the DNA is packaged here. And it's a masterpiece of assembly. Within 20 minutes of infection, there are 300 copies of this. And the question one can pose here, we know all the components, we know the order. Why is it so precise? The cellular environment is highly noisy. Lots of interactions, KT is dominant. Such machines have to be assembled without any interventions with high precision. Why is this so? Until now, we've been able to study these kind of processes, and, and the, the list goes on and on and on of concepts which are prevalent in biology and not in the innate world. These kind of concepts have been basically studied within the context of a living organism, which, it, which means that everything is entangled, everything is complicated. So either you studied it within the context of the living organism, or you simplify it completely. For example, you isolate DNA, you studied it in a test tube. You isolate an enzyme, you studied it in a test tube. But to actually study the reaction of making genes turn on and off dynamically has been absent for lack of techniques. And this is what we set out to do about 10 years ago, to develop the means to look at how genes are turned on and off as in a living cell. And these are just examples that you can imagine, of course, many, many different kinds of examples where genes are turned on and off in response to the environment and so on. So reconstructing cellular compartments, why? This is the outline of the talk. As I said, we simplify uh, um, processes which are inherently entangled in the living organisms. And yes, because it's, it has been challenging. It took us many years to develop the tools. It wasn't there to begin with. So yes, we can. Now I'll show you things which we couldn't do a few years ago, and now we can. How? Ophel said, we're going to put away the membrane. We're going to put away complicated processes such replication, evolution. We're going to stay with something which is much more simple, without a membrane, and we're going to use a surface to immobilize the reactions. Different functions will be carried out in different locations, and that will provide new control parameters, experimental control parameters, to actually implement the kind of reactions that goes on inside the living cell. So I'll tell you about ongoing work for the past years, gene expression in time and space. For the first time, we're able to implement in a man-made compartment, program gene expression in time and coupled in space. That's the first step. I'll then show you a glimpse of the interesting physical properties of the DNA compartment. We're going to be using dense DNA brushes immobilized on surfaces, and they have interesting properties because this is dense, these are a dense phase of polymers which are charged in a liquid with KT interactions, and so it's all somewhat intricate and complicated and has implications for how the machinery has to interact with that within that phase in the compartment. And finally, a very exciting ongoing work is to try to look at assembly of machines like the T4 bacteriophage or even the machine itself, the ribosome. 
such machines have never been reconstituted outside the living cell. And now there are opportunities to start doing so. Okay, the approach, this field has been emerging in the past 10 years. Some may call it cell-free synthetic biology. We actually started that, uh, uh, my, my last paper in the postdoc was actually put forth that notion that you can start to construct these kind of reactions in a, in a, in a test tube. <coughs> But the more natural way to think about making an artificial cell is to encapsulate it inside a membrane because life is encapsulated inside a membrane. Everything is. But there are many challenges, and I put that aside in my own research. Encapsulation is challenging for various reasons. Just imagine having to put many, many components inside capsules which are on the micron scale. That's not easy. Uh, transport. The membrane is a very tough barrier for uh, nutrients for transport of pretty much anything except for water through the membrane is a tough challenge. And most importantly, turnover. Biology has inherently something we are lacking in physics or annihilation operators, if you will. You need turnover. Molecules must be, must be degraded by or evacuated. There must be turnover for things to be viable in a living cell. Every cell has one mechanism or another to generate turnover. That is very challenging in a cell-free reaction, which does not necessarily have all the means to degrade or dilute out what you make. Without turnover, you cannot generate steady state, you cannot erase memory, you cannot do anything. You could just make stuff. That's all we could do until recently. Using the surfaces, which is our approach, allows us to do away with a membrane, work by mobilizing things on a surface, and then having an enclosure, which allows us to basically have control turnover by, trans by diffusive transport that is dictated by geometry. So how do we, how do, we do all this? So this, is, this was the first milestone, milestone. It only took us four years to develop. Uh, this is a, the biochip. It's a molecule which we design, which coats silicon dioxide surfaces uh, from solution. And it's, it binds stably silicon dioxide surfaces it has a, a polymer which makes it biocompatible, which means biomolecules don't stick to it. They like to be there. It's like a thin grass, molecular grass. And at the end, there is a, a chemical group which is cleavable by UV light, which means that once it is coated, we can use the standard lithography approach to basically shine UV light where we want to immobilize information, such as DNA molecules. We shine UV light, we cut this bond, and we make another bond with appropriate linkers and bind DNA, antibodies, and other molecules of interest. This is how we assemble the biochip. This is a not so good image, that's why I like it, of our lab on a chip a few years ago. This is the scale, it's a fluorescent image taken on a microscope, and the molecules which provide this, create this image, are DNA, double-strand DNA molecules, uh, bound to the surface at one end, having a, a the other end a fluorescent molecule, and you can see the gray scale, you can see the scale, you can see the, the aperture, optical aperture, and this is the kind of phases that we make. This is about 100 nanometers, uh, comprising of molecules which are 2,000 bases long DNA, which are appropriate size for coding uh, uh, proteins. Um, Typically, we can assemble them to very small distances of about 20 to 30 nanometers between neighboring polymers. And this is our nucleus. When, you, when I will talk about DNA brushes, keep in mind this. It amounts to a few mega base pairs of DNA per micron cubed locally, which is a huge amount of DNA. So it's a dense phase of DNA, and it will have consequences for what happens inside. Okay. This is the, the most recent advance, and it took us a while to figure this out. And Eyal was the first to recognize this, and he was quickly joined by Alex. And they were able to do magic with this thing. So this is the idea. You carve in silicon, silicon substrate, a two or one or two micron thick uh, uh, structure, which is basically a pancake and a capillary. And it's connected to a thick and wide Grand Canyon. It's a flow channel through which you flow all the cell, all the solution which has all the protein making machinery. Okay, all the soup flows in here. Here we basically deposit, pattern our DNA brushes which code for the proteins to be synthesized. You can do that with all the different chambers, identical or have individual drops spotted by your little robot which means that every DNA brush could be the same or different. Okay, so this is our genetic makeup assembly. We then close the sample 
and flow in the, the, uh, the reaction. And you notice there's no membrane, just a little capillary, thin channel, and a pancake structure. What's the scenario here? Well, this is a reactor which allows the reaction to be in steady state. We've created a source and a sink, and this is the main idea. All the machinery flows in here, but because these are extremely thin, the, mis the hydrodynamic mismatch for flowing in and out is uh, impossible. The hydrodynamic uh, resistance to flow is just huge because this is very, very thin. So what happens, as soon as liquid wets the surfaces inside, molecules can go in and out only by diffusion. And now imagine all the machinery flowing in, by di uh, uh, diffusing in, initiating synthesis of mRNA followed by synthesis of proteins, and everything then, once in a while, these guys just diffuse out, and once they reach here, they're just flushed away. So that's the sink. Here's the source, and that's the sink. So we have a boundary condition of zero concentration of everything you make inside the compartment right here, which means that in time this will reach steady state in which the rate of synthesis and the rate of evacuation out of this structure balance out. That means that we also have a linear gradient because this is only diffusion. We have a linear gradient between the source and a sink. Here's the linear gradient of a <coughs> fluorescent protein made. So we've created conditions for transport, which allows us to maintain things in steady state. Can you say something about what you call, what you call machinery? Is sure. Ribosomes? Yeah. So, so, yeah, good, good. So, thank you. So when I say machinery, I mean ribosomes, amino acids, the building blocks for mRNA, the whole transcription, translation reaction, starting from the DNA, which is encoded here. This is the DNA brush in small scale. Um, and the machinery is the entire soup the, the, the reaction, it has about 100 components of different scales. The ribosome is the most, the biggest one. The diffusion rate is probably very different for different components. Sure. So, yeah, of course. So, when I refer to source and sink, I'm talking about the, mo the new molecules I'm making inside the compartments. That's what I'm showing here. I'm not seeing all the other ones, which may have gradients as well. Correct. Is the brush close to a self-assembly? The brush is a self-assembled structure on its own. I won't go into the self-assembly, but we do that from solution. So we actually have DNA binding from, the, from solution to the surface, and the reason why they form so dense uh, assemblies is, has to do with the interaction between DNA. I'll talk about that later. Any more? Okay. The, there is a natural, there's a time scale which emerges in the problem. It's written here, and the, this is all geometry, pi, r square, w, it's all denoted here. D is the diffusion constant of what you're making, and L is the length of the capillary. And this is not the diffusion time scale, uh, diffusing in here. In fact, it's a longer time scale, which means this is sort of an adiabatic construction in which the diffusion here is a faster process than the time it takes to evacuate the entire volume. Think of it as a capacitor and a resistor. This is the RC of this structure. So that means that there's a lifetime, which means that if you write the, the rate of change of what you're making inside the compartment, it's basically some function. It, this is the source, which is determined by the genes you encode here, minus a degradation term, which is set by geometry. So without degrading the protein physically, we've introduced a ge geometrically determined time scale for evacuation in a controlled manner. And it has to do with this 2D structure and 1D channel. Okay? And there's a linear gradient of everything throughout everything you make throughout the entire experiment. And this is what it looks like. So we've created this steady state without any regulation at this point. You're seeing the synthesis of GFP, a fluorescent protein. The concentration is homogeneous in the compartment. It drops linearly from the compartment down to the exit point. You see this is the actual chip. This is the DNA in fluorescence. This is the uh, fluorescence of the protein, and you can see in time what happens in every compartment. The steady state determines is determined by the length of the capillary, as we predicted. Since you have many components, you have many, you have actually spectra of terms, not tau one. You have the tau For tau the geometry, it's a very good approximation that there's one time scale which determines the evacuation between uh, <coughs> the, the diffusion out of anything you make here. Yeah, there's one. It starts to look somewhat different when you have very short capillaries, but it's a very good approximation when you have this, uh, a ca this uh, pancake and a thin capillary. Why did the last one begin to, uh, begin to rise? Yeah. This one? This one? Yeah. 
begins to rise late much longer. Oh, oh, sure, because it takes time for the machinery to uh, diffuse in. Yeah, so this is at t equals zero when you flush in the, the components, sure. Okay, now don't look at the details. What I'm showing here is the actual design, molecular biology cut and paste of regulatory sequences and genes, which we have carried out in a test tube and then immobilized back on the DNA brush, in the DNA brush, in various compartments to actually study the kind of reactions that until now could only be seen inside the living cell. For example, a gene which activates its own synthesis or a gene which shuts off its own synthesis or two genes which are hooked up in feedback, one inhibiting the other and one inducing the synthesis of the other. Okay, just cut and paste like Lego. This can be done in a test tube and now immobilized. And now for the first time, again, I just want to give you the, the impression that we can see the kind of reactions that until now can only be seen in a living cell. You're seeing a variety of different compartments all in parallel next to each other. In every one, there's a some slightly different genetic makeup. Single gene, no feedback. Single gene, positive feedback. Single gene, negative feedback. Two genes, which lead to emergent oscillations just because of the feedback. We, we do not oscillate anything. This is emergent. And you can see that the amplitude, the phase, the, uh, the frequency is dependent on the geometry. The colors are all the length of the capillaries. So we can control time scales by geometry in the compartment. Okay? So this, again, I want to, every time I see this, I'm blown away because this is entirely new. We couldn't see reactions which typically occur at the scale of the cell outside. And the fact that you can see something which binds back to the DNA to shut or inhibit, to shut off something or turn on something, has to do with the fact that it's highly confined. This is a two micron scale compartment. And if this was much larger, the dilution would mean that this couldn't happen. Okay? Uh, what are the time scales relative to the actual cell? So how does this time scale compare to the cell? Comparable, comparable. In terms of synthesis, comparable. We are in conditions which are about 20-fold more dilute compared to E. coli cyto cytoplasm, but otherwise the intrinsic rates are pretty much the same. Okay, so I'll go to the next step. This opens many possibilities for studying gene expression in these compartments. We'd like to be able to model these kind of reactions, learn something about how resource management, how design principles are embedded in these kind of reactions. Again, we're just, I just showed you complexity that emerges with two genes. Imagine what happens if you go to a scale of 10 and 100 genes with different kind of uh, uh, regulatory elements put together. This is going to be pretty much of a mess, but we can build it step by step. So this is basically reconstructing the genome, if you want, in these compartments and looking at them slowly. And Each curve that you showed is a single experiment, or is it average over many? This one, this specific one, is 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 a single experiment, but you average them out as well. So we have sometimes does many many dozens of experiments, and they're pretty reproducible. It's yeah. Clean data because of averaging, or because of the every experiment. Percent. Every experiment is clean, but it looks the same. If you were to average this, you would get something very clean. Okay, it doesn't mean that we understand. You should ask me why is this not a perfect oscillator? Is it a chaotic one or what? We don't know yet. That's something we're uh, investigating, but yes. Okay, quickly, let's jump to now coupling compartments in space. I just showed you individual compartments. We decided, to, we, we, we looked for the simplest kind of uh, a coupling we could uh, realize. And first, let's see the movie. So what you're going to see is a chain of one, a one dimensional chain of compartments which are connected along the axis. And what you're seeing is the propagation of a front of gene expression, starting from the left-hand side, propagating to the right. This is an overnight experiment, so it's, it's sped up. The speed is about a millimeter per hour. Um, and the way it works is that it actually implements a reaction diffusion equation by design. And let's see how that works. So in every compartment, we immobilize a genetic system which codes for a bistable system, which is basically a genetic switch. The details are not important. Basically, the elements you've seen before, it's an autocatalytic element with its inhibitor. And this system can be placed in two states, low or high. Okay? Now, every compartment is connected to its neighbor via this fork-shaped capillary, uh, uh, capillary, which is also connected to the ground, to the main channel. By the same construction, every 
between every two compartments, there's a linear drop of concentration. It's the same construct carried out now to this axis. And so you can easily compute uh, the drop in concentration between from compartment I down to compartment I plus 1 or I minus 1. Okay, so the fact that you can control the exit point here as well means that you can tune the interaction be to be nearest neighbor only. So by making this point close enough to the ground, you can control the gradient, namely every signal that propagates, that is every signal made here, diffuses to its neighbor along an exponential decaying profile. And we can tune it to be a single compartment distance. Okay, that's control. So we have nearest neighbor interactions only. If I'm, if I'm making a, a protein here, it's not going to arrive here, only to its nearest neighbor. And so you can see that on this chain, basically what is implementing is a, La, dis, a discrete version of a Laplacian diffusion, effective diffusion here. And so you can actually write down with all the, coefficient, all the coefficients here the, prop, the, the, the equation. This is the, the, the uh, lifetime term. And F, again, is where the genes come in. This is where you, in this case, it's a bistable system. But once we have the geometry, you can basically implement any reaction here for the same geometry. Sure, I'll get to that, sure. Yeah, so well, actually I'm coming here right now. So yes, so the front propagation obeys, it's not exactly a Fisher wave, it's something else, but it's in the same class. The velocity, the chosen velocity scales like the square root of the autocatalytic rate times the diffusion constant. This is the natural scale for these kind of front propagation. You, uh, you see that they all scale down, they all uh, collapse in this kind of, every, every compartment turns on only when its neighbor is, uh, has been turned on. And so this is the first demonstration of a reaction diffusion. It's the simplest kind of, 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 of mode, spatial mode, from propagation. Um, interestingly, sorry? How do you like this? Yeah, good question. So we put a small amount of the activator only in the, this compartment, just to give it a kickstart. So it's a domino cascade. Otherwise, they're all identical. Yeah. Yeah, so this system has a, uh, uh, it's simple enough, so you can actually model this. It has a phase diagram and a bifurcation point between a monostable and a bistable. And you can ask yourself what happens as you get close to the transition, as we often do in these kind of dynamical systems, and measure that. And in, fi in fact, what you see as you come from the bistable towards the monostable regime, you see that the velocity actually uh, increases as you would expect. If you're too close cl or close enough to the transition, you see fluctuations. You see that some compartments turn on simultaneously. Some compartments actually propagate. If you're into the monostable, they all light up simultaneously, so there's no propagation. More interestingly, I think, is this fact that if you now look at individual compartments, they're not coupled right now. There's no capillaries connecting them. But they all have the same bistable system and you put them closer and closer to the bistable, monostable transition, okay? You're basically changing the ratio between the two genes, which allows us to go closer and closer to the bifurcation point. And what you see, this is now a monostable system, you have only one high state, is that if you're far away, far away, right here, then all the compartments turn on simultaneously at the same time. You see it takes about three hours to kick on, and then you're, you stay on forever. This is the stable state, one state. If you get closer, you see it takes longer time, and if you give it even longer, it takes much longer, so it diverges. Well, it doesn't diverge really, but just a factor of six or something. Okay? So, but then what you see is that you have variability. Some compartments, otherwise identical, they're fabricated identical. Some compartments are on, and some compartments are off, right? Interesting. So it's not surprising from the physical point of view, but it's interesting biologically because that means that there's a somewhat mecha a, a natural mechanism to be posed next to a transition and make decisions. That's a decision. This guy's off, this guy's on, okay? So that's an interesting uh, line of research we are, we'd like to pursue. I'm sort of summarizing this part to say that we have a new way to generate spatial propagation you can couple pretty much anything now by the same geometry. We are now working, Alex is working to go from 1D to a 2D couple system and try to look at the kind of morphogenetic patterns that uh, appear here. I'm going back to this uh, scenario. This allows us, will allow us to ask questions how it, positional information is encoded in concentration gradients. 
and how circuits, underlying circuits and transports couple in to create something as precise as this. Maybe we can study that. Okay, I'll shift gear and tell you um, something about what happens inside the compartment. So what is the viscosity gradient between the DNA compartment and the screw? No, there's no viscosity gradient because it's a volume fraction is, is very, very low. It's still very, I mean, it's a lot of water. But as you will see, macromolecules, it's, an, it's actually the, the brush is a, an entropic barrier for macromolecules. You will see that macromolecules do not like to be there, and I'm getting there just in a couple of slides. So there's a big difference in what happens inside and outside, but not for everything, for big molecules. Okay, so this is now a zoom in into the, f the scale of the compartment. And again, this is for about one kilo base pair DNA attached at one end of the surface. Uh, that implies about 20 nanometers maximal packing between the DNA polymers. So this is an interesting phase. So what is the conformation of DNA? Do they interact? In some sense, what are the degrees of freedom important for their conformation? Do macromolecules like the machines, the ribosomes or the polymerases, some of which actually interact with the DNA, some don't, do they penetrate into this dense phase? The answer is, well, okay. So here's some interesting ex uh, experiments that were kind of surprising in the beginning. I'm not showing you data, just showing you the summary of, of the results. Uh, this is a very robust result. The first thing we saw is if you take, remember that the transcription now is a directional process, so there's a start site. I mean, think of a sort of elevators. This is a, 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 a brush of DNA. Each one has a sequence. Uh, for example, here, this is the start site, so the, the enzyme that has to transcribe the DNA has to bind, come from solution, from this end, bind here and go along, slide down the polymer, down to, towards the surface, make a copy of the RNA, okay? and vice versa, if the same uh, molecule was turned upside down, that enzyme would sort of have to penetrate in, find its sequence inside, deep inside, close to the surface, and synthesize upward. So this is sort of an elevator kind of uh, uh, model. And it, and it turns out, surprisingly, that if you just take the same kind of molecule, just turn them upside down or put them in different locations, so make short sequences that are transcribed or long ones, the result was always the same that in has a higher rate than out. That wasn't expected initially. That's a very robust uh, result. You always get more uh, when you just turn the DNA upside down. But All the configurations, it's sorry? It's easier to find the start point when uh, it's outside. Mm, I could give a counter argument why that may not be so, but you're right, you're right. The, the, you have to add on top of that, that there's a cycle here. These guys, I mean, the processes are not one cycle. There's energy consumption here by virtue of this polymerization. The reason why the, this is a motor, it consumes chemical energy as it, as it not the binding, but the actual synthesis of RNA and the, the motion along is directional, that's driven by chemical energy. And so uh, it's not unlikely that you will have gradients of concentrations of molecules inside here. The machine, the, the RNA polymerase, the machine that does that, and the RNA itself. This is a long enough molecule with degrees of freedom it doesn't have to be there. Second result, which we uh, observed, and we did that by playing around with DNA brushes of varying density, and you can do that either by just adding more and more genes with the same kind of sequences, or adding just dummy DNA just to make it more dense or less dense. And the result, again, was very robust, that whenever you dilute, the rate of synthesis of RNA from the DNA brush goes up. So the DNA density inhibits the transcription from the brush. So these were solid results, and we didn't really understand why that is so, because the RNA polymerase, the enzyme, has an affinity. It binds to the DNA here. It's not passive, it binds to the DNA and then it slides. So we thought it would actually be facilitating enhancement of rate with density, but the counter uh, result occurred. And so to understand this, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but I, I'd like you to appreciate the kind of physical study that we carried out here, and taught us something very fundamental about the interaction in a dense phase of DNA attached to the surface, something we did not know, which has direct <coughs> implications, for example, for what happens in a dense environment in a cell. So, and there is universal behavior here. So this is really physical uh, 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 behavior that can be understood. And in fact, the theory which eventually explained why, I'll show you in a minute, why this data collapses into some universal curve here with a power law, has to do with the fact that DNA is not just a polymer, it's a charged polymer, uh, 
It's negatively charged along the backbone. As such, it carries a counter ion, a positive one, which is released to the solution next to it. Okay? So it's a charged polymer, not just a polymer. And this theory, which explains this data collapse, was uh, worked out by Phil Pincus in the early 90s for any charged polymer, not DNA. We confirmed this now in DNA. Okay, so what was the experiment? You pattern a gradient of DNA density. Yes, sorry. You say that the polymers are charged. What is the charge <coughs> density? Because I have an idea. Yeah, it's the, it's the most charged polymer we know of. Roughly one charge per nanometer or so, typically. And no idea why the peaks the charge density? Well, that's, an, that's the chemical nature of the DNA. Yes. Okay. So, so again, patterning a linear gradient about, uh, about 100, 200 microns with about 1,000 molecules per micron square, that's good enough for averaging. The result is all averaged here. Okay, this is not a single molecule kind of measurement, it's all averaged out. And what we do is put a fluorophores at the end of the DNA and measure the extension of the DNA from the surface by evanescent excitation, turf microscopy. And you can measure, so, and then we exposed the environment to different conditions of ions, starting from no ions to begin with, to much higher concentration or physiological conditions. And the results were kind of striking. We saw, this is the response function, this is the DNA density along the gradient, and this is the, ex the measured extension of the DNA away from the surface. So you see very different response, and, uh, and the colors correspond to the ionic strength, how many ions you add, salt, melach bishul, okay? So you can see a variety of different regimes. I'll just sort of pictorially uh, give you the, the, the result here. When you have no added, no added uh, ions, namely you just the DNA itself without any additional salt. So the only, the only charges come from the DNA itself. So the counter ions are released to the DNA brush, and they actually stay within the volume of the brush to maintain its neutrality. But that implies now that you have a gas, ideal gas of ions, which just want to expand into an ideal gas, and this is what it does. So when you have no ions, it osmotically extends the brush to its full contour length. Of course, that comes at the expense of the degrees of freedom of the polymer, which are now zero. So the entropy of the DNA goes down. There's no conformational entropy of the DNA itself. But the counter ions are overwhelming, and so they win without any additional ions. So this is why you osmotically extend without any salt. So this is very far from physiological conditions, this phase. As you start to add more salt, this imbalance drops, and the DNA now can relax, because now you have less of an osmotic drive to extend the DNA. The conformational degrees of freedom start to kick in, and you have a balance between these two forces, the natural tendency of the polymer to collapse, maintain a, a, a state of random coil, against the entropy of the, of the counter ions, which, or the salt, which just wants to pull it out. And so this balance results in a universal behavior, just two forces balancing out, which lead to this collapse of data with a power law that can be predicted, I won't go, that was predicted, and we measured. I won't go into that, of course, just to show you that there's universal behavior here that can be understood based on these two competing forces. And when you, and in fact, it was surprising here that the place where excluded volume interactions, which we thought would be very dominating, because polymers are known to have excluded volume interactions, just means that the chains cannot overlap, and at high, high enough density, you expect this overlap to basically reduce the entropy, conventional entropy of the DNA, and induce a stretch of the DNA. In fact, DNA is a stiff molecule. Stiff molecule. It's about 50 nanometers thick, I mean, uh, 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 long, that's the persistence length, for about two nanometers thickness, that's the typical sizes. As such, it can accommodate many, uh, many chains within a given volume. And so the DNA uniquely doesn't extend, even if you pack it, so this is high packing of DNA, you see that the DNA remains in its natural, co natural coil conformation, it doesn't extend. So DNA is unique in that. Now this is, the more, this is the interesting part, dense and salty. Salty means it's neutral. The Debye screening length here is just a couple of nanometers, so it's a neutral polymer. In physiological conditions, the charges don't matter. It's on screened, electrostatically screened, because you have a lot of salt. And so 
this, this region, this heart, so-called the neutral or the mushroom phase, is the most physiologically relevant. And this is the only place here, this phase diagram of ionic strength and DNA density, where the density implies that there starts to be excluded volume interactions. And this is where, in fact, uh, ma other macromolecules would actually be inhibited from penetrating for the same reason. If you take a macromolecule, charged or not charged, of, this, of typical size that is not small, like a polymer or a globule, like an enzyme or a ribosome, it will be excluded. Just like we start to see here, and this is recent results by Dan and, and Michael, showing her labeled ribosomes, fluorescently labeled, in turf microscopy. You see here, this is the DNA image, a gradient of DNA, about 200 microns, I think. And you see here, turf signal of ribosomes which are excluded. They do not penetrate in. They're not active here. They're not busy making proteins from mRNA, so they're excluded passively. Yes? Can you show the previous slide? Sure. It looks like, no, the question is asked whether there is an ordering parameter to the lower one. I can't read what's in there. Yeah, this is the density. This if there is an ordering parameter, the question is, is there a phase transition? No, these are, these are not phase transitions. These are smooth. Okay, I will not go into that. I can talk about it in another seminar. There's much to be said about the DNA physics. Allow me to continue further, but, but thank you. No, thank you. It's fine. Sorry? Okay, okay. So I'm trying to give the, the most important results. Thank you. Okay, so, so, the, so the, the, the basic understanding or the realization that there could be uh, 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 partitioning or actual compartmentalization or concentration gradients between the inside and the outside of the DNA brush is important. Imagine now having uh, proteins, I'm, I'm jumping now to the last part, there are a few slides I'm finishing up, of starting to look at machine assembly. And machine assembly means not, not just which genes code for which protein and how it assembles, but where is it assembled, how is it assembled, how does it couple to the organization of matter. This is why I insisted on this point, because just imagine now that in the DNA brush, as in a cell, all the proteins that need to be coupled together into an assembled structure are synthesized simultaneously because the ribosome self-organized in that vicinity. So this will be a very different problem with different outcome than if you were to do the same process in a bulk solution, okay? So it's important to understand what's the organization or self-organization in this heterogeneous kind of systems. And this is just a simple model system of a DNA brush, it's not a cell. Okay, so there are interesting problems here. And I'm coming to the last few slides, which is something ongoing in the lab, uh, reconstructing machine assembly. I've talked about machines, ribosomes. The ribosome is made of about 50 parts, all encoded in the genome, so it's a machine that makes its own parts and then it has to assemble, so there's old machines making new machines. It's a, one of the fundamental chicken and the egg problem in biology. We are starting to tackle that in our system, but before I won't talk, talk about ribosomes, this is for the future, Shirley has been working on it. I'll describe a simpler system, conceptually simpler system, which is again our favorite phage. And if this is what you would imagine to be an assembly line, this is not what happens inside a cell, and I'm showing here not for the details, just to tell you that you have here, just for the assembly of this tail, it's, it's, a, it's, it's composed of a few dozen different proteins, which are synthesized more or less simultaneously at a, fa at a certain phase in the cell, and everything is extremely noisy, all subject to KT fluctuations and non-specific interactions, which makes this highly, in principle, not precise. And yet, this is an extremely precise and ordered assembly line, as deduced by various biochemical means over the years inside cells. So how do we approach this? And this is again the last three slides. These are our degrees of freedom. I've already shown you, sorry for the colors here, but that's fun. So this is the DNA phase, you know something about that. We've seen how this is encapsulated inside the enclosed reaction, how we can generate a time scale. But now let's think about making proteins and bringing them down to a place where they can assemble. Let's call it a scaffold or a hub or whatever you want to call it. We can actually immobilize traps for the molecules, the proteins we make. Molecular traps or antibodies, doesn't really matter how. Imagine being able to bring back what you make to the surface and have assemblies fished out or pulled back down to the surface by this mechanism. And imagine 
not having the ribosomes in solution, but as in our cells, in every one of ours, the ribosomes are in a different area, all put together in a scaffold. We're not there yet, but we're almost, surely is almost made that work. So obviously, these will lead to different kind of scenarios for what's the outcome of these assemblies. And let me show you when I say assembly, what do I mean? So what we've taken a few years ago, and again, last two slides, we've taken, right, almost. <laughs> We've taken, we've taken uh, uh, the genes out of their context. We've, we've uh, focused on this tail assembly um, and take it a couple of its genes from its natural context, which means we take the DNA sequence coding for this monomer, which make up the crystalline tube from the phage, and synthesize the proteins in a cell-free reaction and observed with electron microscopy what you get. And indeed, you get these crystalline nanotubes. They're not controls, they don't have the right length, but they're the same structure. Likewise, if you take this kind of ring, uh, which basically connect to the capsid, the head of the virus, you actually make, from these monomers, you make these nano rings in vitro. So they actually self-assemble. Okay. The second step was to actually embed traps on the surface so you can localize the products on the surface in designated regions. For example, next to the DNA, as I'll show in the next slide. So that took a while to develop, and Yael Hyman, who is here with Ofer doing her PhD, did that for her master. So that's a big step, because to actually see this, this is done on a glassy membrane, 10 nanometers thin, so you can do the reaction without any disturbance, and wash away briefly, and just go to the EM and observe the actual structures. So this is like you were inside the bacterium, just opening it up and seeing where it happens on a surf the inner surface of a bacteria, where assembly occurs. So this is a crystalline tube that actually grew, we think, on these uh, uh, Y-shaped traps, okay, antibodies that we put down on the surface. Okay? So there's a nucleation and growth process that can actually occur on the surface. And this is our current state. This is developed by Ohad Vonshak. This is a, a, a silicon chip which has many dozens of compartments. Each one, again, is about a one or two micron thick a millimeter in size. This is a two-dimensional arrangement. We also have a one-dimensional arrangement. And we, what, what we have here for the first time is a bunch, say about 100 different spots, which are imprinted by a robot. Each one codes for a different protein. We've taken this wedge, which forms the base plate. It comprises of seven proteins. The names are not important. The colors are not important. All you need to know is that there's a hierarchy of assembly goes on here. And we've taking the genes coding for these uh, proteins and put them individually in the in the, on the surface, lay out traps for the assembly, <coughs> close the compartment, synthesize and observe what happens. How do we observe? Either by EM or by incorporating fluorescent amino acids into the protein. So you can actually see where, which pro you can actually encode, genetically encode, which of these proteins is labeled, which of the protein serves as an anchor, as a trap, and of course, you can do the combinatorics with many, many such kind of compartments to actually ask what happens when you change the composition of the genes, what happens when you mix the order, what happens when you have more of one than the other, and so on and so on, and just measure what happens inside here. So this is, we actually start to see this in action, this is real data, and it's very exciting. Okay, I finished what I wanted to say, I have just the next frontier, okay. The big picture, and I'll zoom out. I've shown you the, the recent development of reconstructing gene expression in man-made compartments on a chip. The chip is passive right now, but you can see it opens many, many directions and open questions. I show this because this is my son's 3,000-piece Lego, Star Wars. If, if you don't like to tinker in this business, probably don't do it. <coughs> we like to. So every time I get Lego for him, I get to play. Where is it going? One direction, ribosome self-assemble. I alluded to that. Imagine being able to actually make the machines de novo. So you have all the genes which codes for the parts. So you have to start with old ribosomes and eventually make all the parts that will eventually assemble into a new ribosome. And so that will be a first step, self-assembly of a ribosome. Nobody's ever proven that possible outside the living cell, starting from the genes. You can put all the purified proteins together, uh, change the condition of the reactions and obtain functional ribosomes. But this is not what happens inside the cell. You have constant synthesis of new parts that then assemble into new ribosomes and so on and so on. So the steady state of machine making. 
Can we do that? The answer is we don't know, but we're working on it. Memory and learning. I've shown you just simple kind of encoded uh, patterns in time and in space. But cells actually learn and store information about their experiences. And they do so by <coughs> storing information in changes of states, molecules that have conformational changes which are reversible on a certain time scale or not. For example, the switching of an, of an, of a, uh, the actual switching of DNA in the brush, for example, from up and down. That will be an irreversible, uh, an, an enzyme can actually do that. So that will be a mechanism to store information that something has happened. And if you couple that to your neighbor, then in principle you can do what neurons can do, which is to sort of synchronize themselves and, and in reinforce. You can couple that to a circuit that will do that for you. Finally, silicon for now for us has just been a sub passive substrate. There's no reason why we should not explore active processes of electric signals in silicon and have the kind of interfaces where the DNA brush, which is a charged molecule, that's why I showed you that, eventually will be, we could manipulate or sense, control and sense, what happens in biosynthesis by electric fields. And I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Y shaped? What is a Y shaped shape? Y shape? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. This is an antibody. 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 In biology, it's. <laughs> yep. Antibody is, is a. Sure, sure. Okay. Okay. Antibody is something that the immune system makes. It, in response to pretty much any molecule, any, any foreign molecule that is introduced, this, the immune system is capable of generating a specific binder. It has a shape of a Y, Y shape, it's a, it's a protein comprised, it's a big protein uh, complex which is made of a few, uh, uh, a few uh, structures. And we use it to specifically capture a sequence on the protein. That's all there is to it. It's just a trap specific to something we can genetically encode. So we can put that trap on every protein we make. That's all there is to it. With, without details. Another physical question about noise. We didn't discuss thermal noise, in, the, in particular in the relation of bifurcation. It's sure, sure. It's not thermal. It's a problem that noise amplified near bifurcation. Sure. Near bifurcation point, it's much sure. worse. Sure. Finally. Sure. And you show that you work near bifurcation point. That's, uh, I mean, uh, near, I mean, maybe near for you is 10 to the minus 3. Here, oh. this is, yeah, okay. So um, the number of molecules participating in these reactions is huge. The number of templates is 10 to the 6 or something in one compartment. So this is not <coughs> noise of small numbers. What we see is more variability which has to do, we think, with the fact that you're close to this bifurcation, which implies that small changes in geometry, I think, kick in. That's all there is to it. Whether one can see other effects of noise, we probably have to go to the small molecule limit and see actual fluctuations of on-off, which is what people nowadays address in, in cells. So actual noise having to do with fluctuations, with small numbers. Th these are not small number fluctuations. I love the experiment where you had everything in series and turning on the neighbors. Okay. You called it the Grand Canyon. I don't understand why oh. everything doesn't flow out into the Grand Canyon. Oh, there's a huge, okay, so. Sure, yeah. We're talking about this. Yeah. Right, so the huge mismatch of about three, or three to four orders of magnitude, this is b between this 2D layer, yeah. okay, here, this 2D layer where all the action occurs, and the flow chamber, which is really thick and wide, okay? So you flow only here, only here, and fluid that is wet at t equals zero, 
wetting this, these surfaces uh, at equal zero, then only diffusion is the transport for molecules. And you prove that just by, I mean, you prove it experimentally. So you have this a big mismatch because, because hydrodynamic resistance goes like one over the, the thickness to the cube. You can actually do very nicely with separating the, diff the uh, making big differences in, in resistance, hydrodynamic resistance. By, by changing the yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course, there is a small, there will always be because. You'll always lose that. Some material. Sure, yeah. you, you, you lose material all the time by this dilution, of course, but that's, that's how we control the time scales, exactly, sure, yeah. You lose it in a controlled way. Just if, if you are able to build this uh, tail of the, of the virus, what kind of questions can you now ask or approach? Yeah, very good. Stuff? So to, to me, the, which I was trying to sort of make a point, the, the since we know all the components, this is a model system, we know all the components, we know the actual order. The question in my mind is fidelity, or if you want to call it thermodynamics. Why, what sets, what is it in the structure, in the stoichiometry, in the regulation, <coughs> what is it in the cell that makes such kind of assembly so precise? You get 300 amazing copies, exact copies in 20 minutes. Why? Is it really very far from thermodynamic equilibrium? Possibly, but Sid, why is it so precise? That, I think that's the key question. Thank you again.